This episode will be all about the latest news on regulation concerning blockchain and crypto, especially news from Wyoming and the UK. Have fun! Welcome to The Blockchain Lawyer, a podcast on technology and law. Dennis Hilleman is an accomplished lawyer with over 13 years of experience and a passion for creating a better future through blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and other disruptive innovations. All statements expressed in this podcast are the opinions of the host and his guests only and are in no way legal or financial advice. And now, here is your host, Dennis. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 19 of The Blockchain Lawyer. My name is Dennis Suleiman. I'm glad you're here. It's first day, the 21st of November 2019, and this episode will be a shorter one. It will be focusing on the latest news concerning the regulation of blockchain and crypto all around the world. But first off, I want to make you know that I'll be speaking in Berlin on Tuesday, the 26th of November. I'm really looking forward to that. It's a conference organized by Jörn Erbgut, a good uh, guy I know from the work at the Deutsche Institut für Normierung, the German Institute for Standardization on a blockchain norm. Jörn has a lot of knowledge concerning blockchain and data privacy rules, especially EU GDPR. A great guy to talk to. He knows a lot of stuff. And he organized a cool event that is part of the UNEGF, the UN Internet Governance Forum in Berlin. And the event is called Trilogy on Blockchain, Sustainable Development and Privacy. It's a conference by EDV Gerichtstag. And it takes place on Tuesday, the 26th of November from 9.30 to 6 p.m. at the Atelier in Prinzenstraße 842. It's a really cool location, I hope. And yeah, we'll be speaking with really cool people and I'll be speaking on the household exemptions concerning EU GDPR and blockchain. I'll podcast, I'll podcast about this as well. But if you want to join that conference, check me, check it out. Uh, link me, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'll give you the link. It will be also streamed live in case you're missing it. So I'll be talking about that on LinkedIn. So if you want to have a look at it, if you have a the time, then drop me, uh, l drop me a note on LinkedIn. So anyhow, let's go deep into the latest news on regulation concerning blockchain and crypto. And first off, I want to start with some news on China still uh, digital currency. You know, I made a podcast about that already two times already because it's coming at the beginning of 2020 and just yesterday there was news from Reuters saying that a representative of the central bank of China noted that once the digital currency is revealed to the public then there will be a horse race from all other institutions in China about offering the best solutions and best solutions in adopting the new digital currency. And this already shows that there will be a lot of pressure, from my point of view, on China's co Chinese companies and institutions to actually use the new digital currency. So this topic will continue to grow within the next weeks and months. We need to keep a close eye on it, eye on it and I'll, of course, update you on the latest news concerning the Chinese digital cryptocurrency on this podcast. And then let's move on. Let's talk about Wyoming. You know, Wyoming is the least populated state in the U.S., but it's probably the most active when it comes to cryptocurrency and blockchain regulations. It was in January 2019 that the Wyoming Senate passed a bill that was also then acknowledged by the House in February 2019, that allows for cryptocurrencies to be recognized as money within Wyoming. So there was a big step forward. It's actually not very complicated regulation. 
So Wyoming wants to take a deep dive, a big chance in cryptocurrencies and blockchain, and therefore already acknowledges cryptocurrencies under certain conditions as money within Wyoming. Big step ahead, something that we should all look at, a good example for all of us. Then in the same month, Wyoming also passed a bill defining certain open blockchain tokens as intangible personal property as well as a bill to establish a fintech regulatory sandbox. And this is also quite fantastic that Wyoming is taking these steps to allow blockchain developers and startups to go to Wyoming and test their ideas, let them grow there where the regulation is good. See, regulation can actually attract investors, can attract startups pretty well. That's why I, I'm always calling for good regulation to make business work with blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And this also has a tradition because in 2018, Wyoming also re regulated the initial coin offerings, the ICOs, as possible within Wyoming, which is also a big deal because there has been a lot of issues with U.S. customers in, by, uh, in uh, participating in ICOs. I once counseled an ICO a little bit and I know how hard it is to attract US customers and especially the KYC procedures if they could particip participate as all. They're really complicated. So Wyoming also went a big step ahead on that level. But Wyoming also has already blockchain banks which are legally known as special purpose Depository Institution, SPDIs, uh, which were approved now in Wyoming, uh, uh, or no, let's say, which were approved already in February, as I just told you. And for these ba blockchain banks, Wyoming has now unveiled a series of opt-in custody rules covering areas such as forks, airdrops, and stockings. The rules were just announced by the Fortem Law Blockchain Regulatory Symposium in New York on November 11, and making already Wyoming already, again, one of the most advanced states when it comes to cryptocurrencies. The rules include the first ever regulatory provisions for digital asset custodians in many areas, including forks, airdrops, staking, customer notes, requirements, and so on. So that's a big step ahead. If you're planning a startup in the U.S., you might want to look at Wyoming as your state of choice because you probably find the most legal certainty there. And I personally think as a German lawyer, who is now, of course, also looking deep into the blockchain strategy of the federal government in Germany, I think we should absolutely follow this example and make sure that Wyoming and other U.S. states don't get too much ahead of us. So Wyoming is big ahead in that. Next news. An anonymous organization dubbed Unknown Fund is planning to give away 30, 75 million Bitcoin uh, dollar, in, in dollar, so Bitcoins worth $75 million dollars. To startups that are focused on anonymity and the protection of personal data. They made a press release saying if you are looking into blockchain and personal data, something we are doing here in Germany as well, then we will finance you and we will finance you while transferring bitcoins of us. So that's a big little thing too because it shows that there's actually support. They said that there's no actual company behind it but like interested people in financing privacy solutions on the blockchain base. And yeah, that's one step ahead on that level too. Um, I'll keep an eye on that if that actually evolves. Then there was a lot of discussion this week about the UK because of the following thing. Um, a panel led by the senior high court judge, Sir Geoffrey Was, issued a legal statement on Monday they took significant steps to address uncertainty around crypto assets and their underlying technologies. The High Court judge leading panel said, with a quote from him, The answers to these legal questions will provide a dispensable foundation for the mainstream utilization of crypto assets in smart legal contracts. 
And what they actually do is like that the UK, that the UK judges represented through this panel classify crypto under certain conditions as property by law and also classify smart contracts as legal binding. So let's make it clear. This panel is actually not law, like the decision of this panel and the statement is not law. But this panel is represented by high judges. And it also represents, from my understanding and the discussion that I read, the majority of ideas that were developed by judges in that area. So most likely, the statement of this panel will be largely adopted and therefore become effective within the courts of the UK and, there, and also in their rulings. Meaning that UK made, without, pro, without passing laws, a huge step forward when it comes to crypto adoption and when it comes to, when it comes to accepting smart contracts as binding. This is another way how you can actually make regulation that I highly appreciate. See, in Germany we're very classical. Whatever is not law is not binding for the courts. But, of course, we've got many laws. We've got also laws on very classic things, like how, for example, what happens when somebody uh, makes a deal about buying some things, what are the rule of the buy uh, what are the rights and duties of a seller, what are the rights and duties of a buyer. So we have many rules that can, could also be uh, used to work with smart contracts. For example, buying and selling on the Ethereum blockchain via smart contracts cannot be any different from my, under, my point of view than buying and selling actually in real life like in the offline world. So what I think is actually that, cor that courts and judges could actually also make an impact on the legal framework for cryptocurrencies and blockchain if the lawmakers are not fast enough. Of course, in Germany now, uh, we've got the blockchain strategy of the federal government, so lawmakers should start. But if they don't, I think that especially the higher courts in Germany could make a point when they have the first cryptocurrencies cases to decide and I'm aware there are quite a few where mostly about uh, Bitcoin deals, like there are deals there and that people, for example, said, hey, we will sell you Bitcoins at a certain point for a certain price, like somehow making a bet that the Bitcoin will be much cheaper to buy at a certain point and then to sell to somebody else with, to, with, with who you concluded the deal before. For example, today I, sell, uh, I would say, hey, I will sell you 10,000 bitcoins in one year for the price of $10,000. And, and the other party agrees on that. So let's say if a bitcoin price is only $5,000 at the time that I need to actually sell the bitcoin for $10,000, I make a great deal. But if a bitcoin cry, uh, price is far higher, for example $15,000, I make a very bad deal. And I know about cases in that people make bad deals and then they said later that the deal, the bet that they actually made, were not legally binding. And I know there are, there are cases in front of German courts which will probably go to the higher courts soon. And then we will, might have the first decisions by the higher courts in Germany, the Bundesgerichtshof, the federal court for civil, uh, for civil cases. Um, which could also have a huge impact on the regulation and the law practice in Germany concerning cryptocurrencies and blockchain. So basically we can learn from the UK if a, if a, if a judges make a point stating, hey, cryptocurrencies are property and stating that smart contracts are binding, then this will also create a legal frame for startups and companies to work with. So I think the UK is already a step ahead now and I hope that the rest of Europe and especially, of course, Germany will follow with such decisions, with such progressive views on blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Then we have 
The last news for the day, that's concerning the U.S. And the U.S. government will reportedly be enforcing a rule which, requ which will require companies dealing in cryptocurrencies, including digital asset wallet providers and exchanges, to share details about their clients. This is something that, according to Kenneth Branico, director of the Financial Crimes Enforcement Networks of the U.S., will become effective pretty soon. And the new rules will require companies to identify the senders and recipients of crypto transactions worth $3,000 or more. The personal detail of the parties involved in these transfers must be sent to counterparties if they exist. So this will also like change the regulation a little bit in the U.S. and of course make it not make it easier, especially for exchanges to make their way through the U.S. But of course, this is all to prevent money laundering and to tax evasion, which are of course big topics when it comes to the digital world with blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Then a few little things. Let me just add that. Um, we've got Eric Lanchevec, I hope I pronounced that right, who is the founder of the blockchain ledger in French Capital, um, like in the magazine French Capital. He said that big businesses can work with volatile crypto like Bitcoin or Ethereum, ETH, and that big businesses will need stable coins. And as nobody wants the Libra as such, and of course, like I said, Nobody actually wants that the Chinese digital currency will conquer the world. He opted for the fact that the digital euro must come, which is something which I already talked about in this podcast as well, that the digital euro is especially a project by France and uh, it's, been, it's President Macron. Germany is also looking into that. I think he's very right with that topic. If I think, as a lawyer, I would need to accept payments in crypto, then I didn't, don't want them to be volatile because I need people to pay, I need rent to pay. So if crypto payments were made possible, actually, then in a larger context for large companies, stablecoins probably make sense. But these stablecoins probably should not come from companies such as uh, Libra from Facebook. So I'm very interested in seeing this development when it comes to uh, stable coins, if we actually will get the digital euro, because this will have huge consequences. I Let me just explain this to you. In Germany, the euro is the only accepted method of payment. If you get, for example, a fine by for um, driving too fast or parking the wrong way, you must pay it in euro. You must pay it either in cash or you must via the money via banks. So if the digital euro comes, if it's going to be an accepted payment, then you have the right as a German civilian to also pay such a fine with a digital euro. Like the administration can't say, no, you're not allowed to pay with a digital euro because we're not prepared for that. No, then you have a right for that. So you see, if a digital euro comes, it will actually change a lot, a whole lot when it comes to dealing with companies, dealing with administrations. Then you may also pay the bread you pay you pay, buy in the morning with a digital euro. So you see, just like saying that we need the digital euro is pretty easy. And perhaps even the technical solutions to develop such a digital euro is not too complicated. But the consequences for our everyday life, they would be really, really huge. So that is why I think we must be careful with, these, with, uh, with demanding this. And we must take notice of what will be the consequences for that. But in the end, I also agree that the digital euro is absolutely inevitable. We need the digital euro. So anyhow, this is for today an update on blockchain regulation that will I that I will do from now on more regularly. Hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, hit me up on LinkedIn if you want to comment on this, if you want to propose ideas, if you want to be an interview partner for this podcast. Hope to hear from you soon and have a good week. This is Dennis speaking and until next time with this podcast, The Blockchain Lawyer. 
If you want to learn more about Dennis, please visit his website, theblockchain.lawyer, or connect with him on LinkedIn or Twitter. Until next time, everyone. 